Well, hello, and welcome on board the live safari that has just kicked off. My name is Scott. I'm teamed up with Tebs on camera and really looking forward to the adventure this morning. There's been reports of lions calling from Lynn. Thank you very much. Lynn's obviously been listening very closely to the Juma Waterhole, which has got some wonderful new uh, speakers that pick up great audio. And Lynn, you are not the only person to hear those lions. Mr. Leo Smith, who is driving the other vehicle this morning, also heard the lions and he's headed in the direction that they were calling in, which was north and east towards kind of Buffalo's of Dam, the northeastern corner of Juma. Myself and Tebs are doing a bit of a pincer movement and working the western side of Juma and are also going to continue east, kind of towards where Brent is along our northern boundary. I'm hoping that we're going to find any sign of possibly Karuna, a female leopard, coming back from that area. We know she headed there yesterday morning, and let's hope that she's going to come back onto Juma sometime, or has already last night, and then we can follow her tracks. As I said, this is a live safari. Please let us know your thoughts, comments, and questions. And to do so, you would hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or send an email through to questions at wilder.tv. Now, if this is your first safari, please let us know. And we've got new people joining every day, and it's so wonderful that the family is growing very, very quickly. John, who is saying, here, yeah, kitty, kitty, and that would be great. Lion or leopard to start off the sunrise safari would be great. Lion have been a little bit scarce as of late, but that happens from time to time. They move off for a couple of weeks and then come back, or they come back when we're asleep, which has happened once or twice, and then disappeared in the course of the night. So that's great news, and Angel Lady, says yes come a little bit closer and hopefully both the lion and the leopard have come closer to juma last night it certainly is possible but if they haven't the good news is, is there's so much else to see and explore and enjoy out here that it won't be a major issue if in fact they have not made it to where we are and we have found some leopard tracks let me just reposition the vehicle female leopard tracks and they're heading along via Tiller access straight towards the entrance gate to the Sabi Sands. Now what I'm going to try and do is shine the spotlights at a low angle like that and then Teb should be able to find some of the tracks. And there we go. Now you can see them quite nicely. Now what I'm going to try and do is simulates how tracking in the early morning when the sun is at a low angle, like this, I'm holding the spotlights at kind of three feet off the ground, dangling my arm out the window. Now, as I lift the spotlights up and shine it straight down onto the tracks, as the sun would be when it's high above us, look at how difficult it is to see them because you're not getting that shadow cast from a low angle. There's the low angle again. So that gives you an idea of why it's best to track in the early morning and the late evening. You can see her back pad and the toes in front of that, so heading down this road in the same direction that we're heading in. And this is interesting. I'm not too sure who this could be. I mean, it could be Karula, but it also could be Shadow or another young female leopard who's also been seen in this general area and her name is Shiluva, and we don't see her very often. Great start, start though, and before we've even got to where we thought we were gonna find some tracks, we we're in the money. Now, we have the tricky job of trying to work out where exactly she has gone. Hey, Mike in Florida has just let us know that he's got a lucky feeling. He's feeling good about this morning. And Mike, I hope you're right. I'm also feeling good though. 
So that makes two of us. I'm just going to drive very slowly now, just to try and make sure I don't miss where her tracks may leave this road. Ideally, she'll stay on this road for quite some time. But there are no guarantees. Yes, I love following tracks though. It's one of the most exciting things you can do out here because now we know a leopard watcher. I mean, how long ago? Not too sure, but definitely last night. And somewhere on the end of these footprints is a leopard. Now I'm gonna do my best to try focus staying on her, her track. She's crossed onto the left-hand side of the road now. And while we do that, you guys are gonna be jumping onto Brent's vehicle for a quick update. Good morning and welcome to Safari Live. I'm Brent Leo Smith. I've got VM on camera and that's a buffalo bull doing his morning ablutions. So we're right in the area where I think the lions might have been calling earlier this morning. And it's right on our northeastern corner. There's a herd of buffalo that passed through here that we saw on yesterday's sunrise safari. And I was hoping maybe that attracted the lions into this area. And as we can see, one buffalo bull looks like he might be trailing the herd. And we're just gonna sit for a little bit longer quietly here. Uh, probably the last time I heard them roaring was about 20, 25 minutes ago. So I'm hoping now that we're much closer and uh, that if we get some audio, they give us a better idea of where they are. Unfortunately, my gut tells me uh, they're further to the east towards Kruger that way. But this is definitely uh, one of my favorite times of the day. Pre-dawn, first light, which seems so new and fresh. Almost, not even, almost, almost no wind. There's a tiny little breeze moving some of the leaves. But in this nice, cool, still morning, uh, the sound travels quite nicely, so we just want to hear that. Maybe they'll listen to me and come jogging in. Unlikely, though. Yeah. <laughs> Final control thought that was a real lion. <laughs> Unfortunately, it wasn't. It was just me. So, Vim, what do you think? There we go, look for some lions or leopards. Yeah, I think. Or all of the above. All of the above. Wild dogs, check. We'll find all the animals all the time. So we're just going to listen for one more minute and then I'm going to head off further south. Lauren in New York's wondering how long has it been since the lion's been seen on the live safaris. Lauren, um, it's been quite a while. Uh, the 24th of December 2015 uh, was the last lion seen. Uh, you can hear that bird calling behind us. The red crested Koran. Well, we're going to head further east down. I'm sorry, further south down the eastern boundary. Uh, keep checking for tracks, maybe uh, something to come in. There's always a good chance uh, of finding tracks of something around these parts. Oh. Now, there's an interesting sight. There's a corralled group of buffalo on the road. And I wonder if they are a gentleman's club or is it a small, little, a small breeding herd? If it is a small breeding herd, the way they're lying, they could have had a, a busy night trying to see off the cats. Because I think it could be part of the larger breeding herd that we saw yesterday that maybe has been split and chased. But uh, still no signs of lion tracks yet. Just buffalo tracks everywhere. No running buffalo tracks. So 
have a closer look. I think it is a little breathing herd. too relaxed to have been overly harassed by kitty cats last night but it is a good sign they're still in the area and uh, a breeding herd of buffalo with all their noises that they make um, is pretty much a beacon to lions or on the hunt all oh, tiny little calf it's a couple of really small calves in this in this Group burn, born in the last week or so. I oh, see they might have been harassed last night. The buffalo quite often do this. They'll find a slightly more open area, corral together overnight as one of the defense mechanisms against lions. There are those noises I'm talking about that attract lions. little one. It's a very young calf. There's a couple of little babies here. And Mariette's wondering how do we distinguish between lion and leopard tracks? Well, Mariette lion tracks are much, much bigger. There's another little one. That's three little babies that I can see just in this little group here. All quite young. Now, buffalo have quite an interesting thing. One of the only animals that can, uh, the calves can move, feed while the, the, the herd is on the move. And that's because they obviously traverse quite big distances between food and water. And the calves will actually walk directly behind the mom uh, suckling as as they move. So that one on the left, let's have a look at that one lying down on the left. Tiny baby underneath there. That looks like it could even be younger than the others. And look at that buffalo eyeing us out between the legs of the rest of the herd. And that is tiny, a couple of days old. So that bull we initially saw as I wandered towards the herd, it said it looked like he could be trailing the herd. Well, he's quite an old bull. And it's interesting to see if the younger bulls in this herd take offense to his arrival. So we're stopping just off the distance. There's another sort of set of bulls. So quite often the bulls will sleep on the peripheries of the herd in case of a visitation by lions. Here we go. Welcoming committees on their way. See, adult bulls, not quite as old as this guy who's just arrived. Look a bit younger. Not quite as beaten. See, the one on the left from the herd is a smaller body size. <laughs> Buffalo standoff. So, love three dogs in one room. Are the lions we heard most likely tracking this bu this buffalo herd? Well, it's very difficult to say. There's, there's, there's 
probably seven or eight buffalo herds around in, in the northern Sabi Sands at the moment. So we just gotta hope this is the closest buffalo herd to those lions we heard, we, that were calling this morning. But it doesn't look like it from their behavior. It doesn't look like they've been too harassed overnight. But uh, you never know until we can find some tracks or even better, some lions. Right here, there we go. A snort and a couple of more steps. You can see the, the stance of the left hand male. So of course, there'll be a, a number of males that'll stay with this breeding herd, but sometimes males do come and go from the herd. And there's often some incredible fights for the mating rights in the herds. Obviously being within a herd is, is very beneficial if you want to uh, spread your genetics. It looks like this buffalo might have been part of the herd, he just might have been left behind. Or otherwise, this buffalo is making a very clever sneak attack, but the old bull moves into position, make sure he's not blindsided. And we got a little bit of displaying going on. So you see that he's rubbing his horns against uh, that little bush there. So Dylan in Iowa is wondering, is the older bull likely to be more likely to be caught by the lion? Out of a herd like this, Dylan, um, that generally prefer to go for sub-adults. Okay, so now, He's smelling females, and uh, one would say he could be quite excited. There's a bit more displaying going on behind him. It is possible he is part of this herd, but just the way he's approaching, seen a good buffalo boxing match for a while. Unfortunately, I don't think... Oh, there we go. It's actually submissive behavior that's going on here. And so this other bull actually showed this submissive behavior to the big bull who's moved in. So it probably is part of the herd. And one of the more dominant bulls in the herd. So we're gonna sit with this herd a little bit longer and, and listen again. And while we do that, let's go across to Scotty, who's got one of our feathered friends. So there was a woodpecker drumming loudly in a tree next to us, but it flew off. Not a problem though, we've got a plan B. Take a look further down the road here. Now, the female leopard tracks veered north and east off our main access road. Hello, Zebbies. And we're heading towards this boundary road, which is our western boundary and I've got a feeling that she may be heading towards a little water hole on their side we're just on our way to check carefully just to make sure she did in fact cross because if she didn't then we know she's still on Juma which is good news so let's see what happens I'm sure in the next few meters we'll find out whether she has in fact crossed it's not too far to this water hole, and I think the zebra could well be on their way there. Now, when checking for tracks, it's often very, very useful to move slowly so that you don't miss anything. So that is exactly what I'm going to do. 
especially in the early morning because the sun hasn't come up yet. It's not too easy to see the tracks. about 20 meters further down is the actual road to the water hole, but you could have crossed just a little bit north or a little bit south of that road. There's a lot of little game trails, miniature highways that lead towards the water hole. And I'm hoping that we're going to find her track somewhere here. Even if she's headed there for a drink, she could well come back, especially if it is Karula. Very happy to hear that you've got faith in me. Brian seems to think I've got what it takes to find this leopard. And thank you, Brian. Now I'm feeling the pressure. <laughs> awesome. Well, we do have these zebras right in front of us here. Off it goes. Not to worry. Um, so, no tracks. No tracks. So that's not a bad thing because that could well mean that the leopard is still in our midst, but there is also a chance that I've missed her tracks crossing here. So the zebra also a little seem a little bit seem a little bit on edge. Which makes me think that maybe the leopards passed through here fairly recently. to Doug in Arizona who's interested to clear up some interesting behavior amongst predators and Doug knows that predators realize that they've got competition with one another and therefore they kill one another at any opportunity. Lions in this area being the predator that's the top of the food chain and depending on numbers there's various different kind of hierarchies that could unfold, but it's basically lion, hyena, leopard, wild dog, depending on numbers, but probably wild dog, then leopard, then cheetah. And they will all call, kill one another, but quite often they won't feed on their, the opponent they kill, of their opponents. And we'd like to know why is that the case? It's hard to be certain why that's the case, but it's not always the case that they don't feed on one another. And it's a bit of a misconception that was written in textbooks, probably mostly older textbooks, but initially I remember when I started out my guiding career, the thought process was that when predators kill another predator, they don't feed on them. Now, that's not always the case, and I've seen leopard, feeding on wild dog, leopard feeding on cheetah, leopard feeding on their own cubs that have been killed, to be honest, by other leopard. So it's certainly not that predators will not feed on other predators. The same goes for lions. Sometimes lion will feed on predators that they've killed, be it their own species, young cubs, old lioness, hyena. So basically it is possible. It just varies and depends on the individual animals and on the individual day. So now I'm just going to go back up this road to check extra carefully to see that our tracks have not crossed. And if they don't, then I'll probably jump off and go for a short walk through this block. She could be sleeping somewhere very close by. It's not far at all from the road that she was moving along to our right to where we are here. It's probably only about a quarter of a mile. It's a very small wedge of area that I've had to check. And 
Let's send you back to Brent with the baby buffalo as Tebs and myself continue trying to fine tune this leopard search. So we moved to where the three little babies were, and uh, that one there, if we, when he turns around, you actually see still got a piece of his umbilical cord attached and not very sure on his feet. I'm guessing probably born yesterday for the youngest of the three little guys. And there's, I'd say the second youngest, also very young, no more than a couple of days old, still snoozing. And then just behind, the oldest of the three little ones and very thirsty he is. And you can actually see the milk on his lip every now and then when he gets there. And watch carefully. And when he feels like the, the udders aren't producing, there we go, enough milk. <laughs> He'll tug quite hard and headbutt them. And we saw Impala doing that yesterday on the Sunset Safari. And it is quite a common thing on a lot of animals. It's uh, to stimulate milk production. There we go. You can see he's got a bit of a milk moustache. You can hear a buffalo peeing in the background. Almost sounds like there's a bust water pipe somewhere. And this <laughs> cow's giving us the evil eye. She's come closer uh, to us and just giving us a good, good look. And it's a perfect example there of a, a buffalo cow if you look at the horns and have those massive hard bosses that the males have. You can see there's quite a lot of hair there. Oh, she's got a bit of a growth above her eye. And then you can see the dominant, one of the dominant bulls are, he's walking off now. It's actually quite nice. We can see quite a few different stages of a buffalo bull's horns in here. Let's start on this big boy here, just to the left of him. You can see, um, and if we zoom right in close on the boss, you can see there's no hair growing on it. It's hard. So it's already hardened. And, and quite often you hear the term, there we go, you can see, um, for a buffalo called a soft boss. And let me just have a quick look. There's a young male over here. You can see his... Um, let's actually start with that one there. That, that guy there. So he's an adult, but his boss hasn't fully hardened yet. You can see there's a little bit of hair there, but uh, it is getting there, so he's still quite young. And you can see he's going to be a nice big boy. And there we go. There's a younger male there, and you can see quite a lot of hair on his boss. So very still much a soft boss. Dean says they start out so cute and end up kind of ugly. Sorry, buffalo. Yes, yeah, buffalo are not the prettiest animal we have in the bush, but a really important cog in the ecosystem, um, especially the big breeding herds. And so as they move, they turn over the ground. Uh, hoof action is what it's called, and it helps push seed, grass seeds deeper into the ground. They're also great big mowing and fertilizing machines at the same time. And see the preorbital gland there, just under that female's eye. And we've got two species of bird that are quite attached to buffalo herds at this time of the year. Of course, the ever-present oxpeckers. And these guys have just arrived. They've just woken up. And we can see, there we go, red-billed oxpecker. Doing a little morning preening. And there is, where did they go now? They 
awesome. There we go. Okay. There we go. Just that little bush there. Yeah, I'm just zoom in. Just behind that buffalo lying down. And there we go. You see them there? There's another bird that actually often follows buffalo herds at this time. It's a male wattled star. <laughs> you got nearly kicked. But it's underneath the head of that one there now. Oh, off it goes. That's it. Uh, feeding off whatever insects are disturbed as the buffalo move because the oxpack is actually feeding off here comes a bull plowing through the middle oh there you go waddle starling jumped up onto the stick there to avoid being trampled oh see this big bull causing a bit of havoc as he moves through the herd pushing buffalo out of the way as he goes Like he's waking them up. Yep, waking up. Time to get moving. Um, we can actually see there he's sniffing to check if that female is possibly in each estrus uh, or ready for mating. <laughs> Buffalo don't have a specific breeding season like a lot of the other animals, like wildebeest and impala, and uh, they'll breed throughout the year. You can see the dust caused by that little ruckus. moving too too much uh, as it gets warmer they will try and move towards uh, some water and so Meredith is wondering do buffalo get fleas uh, not really their, their hair's a bit short for fleas but they do get a lot of ticks uh, and mites but other animals out here Meredith do get fleas hyenas leopard lion Jackal, a lot of your carnivores will have fleas. Uh, normally, your short-haired animals have less fleas, and some of these buffalo don't have much hair on them at all. Does anyone know what buffalo milk tastes like? Well, Dylan, I think it'd be quite difficult to, to milk one of these guys. <laughs> they are well known for being quite cantankerous, uh, especially one of the more dangerous animals on foot in the bush, all the buffalo, old buffalo bulls. But uh, Dylan also says it must be very heavy in protein. Needs to get some for his workout procedure. I think uh, the workout would be getting the buffalo milk, Dylan, <laughs> rather than the milk itself. Uh, well, Indian water buffalo, obviously this is a Cape buffalo or African buffalo. Uh, Indian water buffalo uh, are farmed in Italy for something that quite a few people, I'm sure, have tasted. Uh, mozzarella de bouffe. Oh, yellow bull. There we go. Yellow bull oxpecker. It just disappeared. There it is going on to there. Now there's the more rare ox pickers. You've got a yellow bull and a red bull next to each other. You can see the yellow bull's slightly larger. Oh, he's got a big tick. And the yellow bulls took it from him. <laughs> and, and see there, the bigger ox picker species stole it. Oh, isn't that awesome? Oh, it's, it's almost too big to swallow. So they've got little... Oh, there we go. No. <laughs> uh, we might see it. Oh, no, there you go. You got it down. I was wondering if we were going to have to perform the Heimlich maneuver on that yellow pulled oxpecker. That was a big meal stolen from the Red Bull. So, Tom and Dallas would like to know who cleans the ticks from the oxpeckers? Uh, well, they don't really get any ticks, they're a bit small. They do get mites. And one of the ways they do try to control mites is with dust bathing. There we go, you can see there's a red bulldog picket searching for ticks. So their ox pecker's beaks are a little like a little serrated comb. And they're able to sort of go through the hair and pick out the ectoparasites. And always remember there's lots of tick species of different sizes.
So a lot of these buffalo have a lot of ticks uh, around their sort of nether regions, udders, and that. And Gen B is wondering, wouldn't that hurt? I get more itches. Uh, it's more irritating than painful. And so you often find buffalo sort of straddling a bush and having a good scratch to try and get rid of them. Uh, and of course, ticks are quite important in the bush. Uh, everything does have their niche in the ecosystem. Uh, especially on, on older animals can actually lose condition because of ticks and get infestations completely. But I think this buffalo look like some of them are starting to sort of wake up and move on a little bit, uh, but the majority are still bedded down. So I think we're going to move on, see if we can find any tracks. Those lions just have not been playing along. They have not called again. So let's carry on and see what else is out here. vehicle run for a few seconds. I don't want to give them a big fright. Uh, and that's why we managed to get so close to even these little babies. This is we approached very slowly in low range. We didn't rush in. So just let the vehicle run for a little bit before we move past them. Bye guys. Have you ever thought you'd enjoy certain animals uh, before watching this show? There's now a buffalo staring you down. Staring him down is one of his favorites. So, uh, there's a... When a buffalo sort of looks down his nose at you, um, it's always said that look, he looks at you like you owe him money. Imagine, you can imagine that a buffalo bull, you had to make a caricature uh, of, of some of the animals out here. Uh, it would be the lone shark. like to know whether the males are more dangerous than the females when it regards uh, to for, for humans. Uh, generally, yes, and it, it is the buffalo bulls. Uh, and I'll explain that now, but I've just spotted a European roller. Don't fly. Oh, you're in the pool. disappeared and we'll have to keep looking for another one. So he said the reason the males are, are more dangerous generally for humans it's it's the sort of retired gentleman's club those old bulls that have moved away from the breeding herds. Breeding herds per se on foot are not nearly as, as risky to, to approach uh, and I don't know we've actually I've sat and had a whole breeding herd on top of a turn up turn up mine and a whole breeding herd go around me but those particular buffaloes, old old bulls like the ones we see around at the Juma waterhole camp, um, they are uh, possibly more dangerous. I'm just gonna update Aubrey. Morning, um, this is the family of Nyari Chile Katlan, close to the junction bubbles of Katlan. Scott's following up on Wansati, Ingo and Konzo, uh, around Buetala Access. I'm not sure what the last direction was. Uh, and there was audio of Ngala uh, to the east of Chile Katlan Junction, Buffalo Katlan. Copy Orb Scott's um, on foot at the moment, so, so I think as soon as he gets back on the vehicle, uh, he can give you an update on where to check. There we go, just keeping everyone up to date. It is really important. Um, finding animals is a team game and we all help each other. So back to Lisa's question, and, and the, the reason being that those buffalo bulls are, are, are potentially more dangerous than the breeding herds uh, is that they're past their prime. They're a bit old, a bit blind, a bit deaf. Uh, they also like to 
lie up in thickets around uh, sort of dry creek beds and pans and they don't move too far and they can actually really really sleep and quite often you can surprise them and that's when it's, it's, it's it can be potentially dangerous and uh, with most animals there's sort of that flight and so it's, it's the three F's they get a fright and now it depends whether you're sitting in the flight or fight zone oh the sand in the brakes sorry about that a quick look here Tracks. So there's sort of three things. If an animal gets a fright, it looks up, and depending on how close you are to it, and each animal uh, and species has very different flight and fright zones, uh, and in a lot of cases, uh, even the different individuals will have different fright and flight zones. Uh, or sorry, fight and flight zones. So 90% of the time, if, if, if you're not too close, uh, you're in that flight zone and animals will move away. But if you happen to be in the fight zone, it's not a good place to be. Quite a lot of Ellie tracks up and down here as well. So hopefully those big bulls are still around and maybe some of those big breeding herds. We've been having fantastic elephant viewing over the last few days. Here's an interesting one. Let's test you guys. Um, can you get that there, will they? So, well, let's just start. There's some elephant dung there. Give you a clue. It's a bit older. And quite orange. Now, Closer to us, we have this green ball. And I wonder if anyone can guess what it is. And you can see there's elephant tracks around it. But that doesn't look like dung to me. I wonder if anyone can guess what that is. And if you think you do know, uh, drop us an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Who can figure out what that is? A bit of a a quiz nice and early make sure everyone's paying attention not dozing while on safari that would just be unacceptable Safari Live, welcome to Chloe Bear, who's a new viewer. Uh, great to have you along on the game drive, Chloe. Um, Chloe Bear would like to know, have we ever captured a lion attacking an animal on camera uh, on the live safaris? We have, we've actually captured them chasing things quite a few times, uh, quite often buffalo. And then I was lucky enough last year that we caught on camera uh, with Andrew, uh, the whole buffalo a whole lion buffalo hunt uh, from start to finish and they uh, and they killed that buffalo on the live drives it was an incredible sighting and, uh, and i know scotty's caught um the karula were you with them there Viam yeah, and Viam was with uh, scott last year when karula the female leopard that's dominant in this area uh Viam and scott managed to catch her killing a baby impala live Let's try to think, I think. What are the lives? Last week, last, last big cat, two years, two years ago. Uh, the first big cat week, I think it was. Yeah. Um, the Birmingham boys uh, on the buffalo as well. And this last big cat week, male leopard Tingana uh, catching warthog piglets, uh, actually going in underground and pulling them out. Shadow and an impala, another female leopard. Wild dog, yes, we've had a few wild dog kills, so we do uh, catch uh, the animals on the prowl, so to speak, and on the hunt, and we are able to view that whole thing, which is an incredible thing. I mean, it al it's almost mind-blowing that we can show you lions hunting buffalo, so I'm just checking for tracks here. Lots of hyena tracks. So, lots and lots of hyena tracks, but no leopard tracks. There was a hippo that died uh, on this property to the east of us uh, a few days ago and I think that's where all the hyena are off to. 
but uh, it is incredible to think. It's almost mind-boggling to think I'm sitting out here in the middle of the bush uh, in the Greater Kruger National Park, and you guys could be anywhere in the world joining us on a live African safari. So, for the new viewers, you'll often see that we stop and look at tracks or even just listen. Uh, and it's a very important reason why we do that. Quite often, ears will find animals for you before your eyes. So there's lots of little things we listen for. Lion roaring being one of them. Leopard sawing. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't know what a leopard call sounds like, the best description is, a, is of someone sort of sawing wood with a large saw and sort of... And that's a leopard cough or saw. Uh, and but the main way we find a lot of the predators, lions, leopards, cheetah, uh, things like that, is from the alarm calls of other animals. Uh, so a lot of the other animals, when they spot a potential predator, uh, they will start shouting, uh, and quite often they will be saying in squirrel or impala, lion, 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 or leopard, 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 and. Uh, I'll tell you guys a little story, a very funny story about an incredible uh, sighting I saw in Botswana that involved lions and baboons, but we'll do that a little later. So, unfortunately, no tracks yet. I know Scotty is following leopard tracks uh, in the west of the reserve. We're right on the eastern boundary at the moment. There's been a few answers in for that little green ball of mm, that was on the road. Uh, one is a cat, a big cat scat. Unfortunately not. If you look carefully in there, guys, there's lots of grass and leaves and little branches. Uh, and another one was a, a, some type of hairball. Uh, closer, and then a regurgitated grass eaten by a leopard. Again, not quite close, but on the right track with regurgitation. Not really regurgitated, uh, but I'll give you guys one more chance before I let you know what it was. So, Lynn and Teresa say, is it cud? No, you're a bit closer. So what that is, guys, is a, is a, is a bolus. Um, of the branches and leaves uh, that has been chewed on by an elephant and obviously it's decided that it isn't as tasty as it thought so it's chewed on to try to get some of the nutrients at least out of out of that it's probably uh, you find that the eddies are eating a lot of bushes and trees that they wouldn't normally eat because of the, the, the very dry period we're going through so it's chewed on that almost uh, and then spat it out so that's from an elephant you can just see by the size of it and the color uh, it hadn't been through the digestive system well, Raisa, well done. It just sent through that answer. Hello, little Steenbokel. A little male Steenbok. And very cute little guys. And one of the only monogamous animals we get out here. And also an animal that's not dependent on permanent water. They're able to get a lot of their water from the dew in the early mornings, like now. They'll also dig up bulbs and tubers. And they live in a very, very small little territory, about two hectares, which is just over four acres. And uh, sometimes you'll see the male and female together. They don't always right next to each other. And because they live in such a, a small area, they'll also always, they bury their feces. So they'll dig a little hole and defecate and then cover it up and that's to try mask their presence in the area to predators they are a favorite food of leopards and wild dogs and cheetah sometimes and if we 
and see how well that little camouflage works. So how they mark their territory uh, for other Stenborg is a bit different because obviously if they're burying their feces and urine, uh, how are they going to mark it? And when he pops out from behind that bush, I ask them to zoom in nice and close just below his eyes. There we go. Oh, look at all those flies on him. So if we look carefully, um, the flies are actually mask marking it. He says a little black uh, spot just below his eye. And that is called a preorbital gland. And what that is, is it's, it's, it secretes a substance and, and obviously very easy for Sternbock to smell. And they'll rub that against little trees and bushes. And that's how they mark their territory against for other Sternbock to know. Now those flies, I'm surprised he's moving around so calmly, are incredibly irritating. And uh, we get bitten by them as well. Um, they're called stable flies. They look very similar to a house fly, except they're greedy little vampire flies and that they're, they're, they'll drink blood. And at the moment, there's a lot of them around. And you can get them on buffalo, parlor, and you can see Sternbok, also on all the predators. And um, they are very, very much painful. It causes our cameramen to quite often cover up completely and look like sort of ninja assassins. Uh, but while we continue to check in the eastern, oh, what running did you see? Off. You see running off. I was a no, it was a big water. Oh, water. water a big water mail ran across the road. Uh, we'll see if we can have a quick look at him. If not, we're going to head to Scott, who's got some tracks to show you. Let's have a quick look. Uh, it looks like that warthog has done a disappearing act. He was highly mobile when I spotted him running across the road. So let's go see what tracks Scotty's got. So sadly, it appears that this leopard that we are following has crossed north over our northern boundary. She's been weaving in and out of our access road. And you can see one of her tracks, two of her tracks, three, four, not easy to see though, but as Teb zooms in, you'll notice the back pad and then one, two, three, four toes in the front where my fingers kind of curled around. And she's headed straight north down this little pathway all the way to <coughs> Sydney's Dam. She may have looped around, which is interesting. And I'm going to just take this little road here because I've told Aubrey about these tracks. And Aubrey and his guests are allowed to go onto this northern property called Buffalo's Hook. But interestingly enough, on his way here, he's found some more leopard tracks crossing west out of Juma. So I'm not too sure what's going on. Maybe there were two leopard in the area, or maybe the same leopard has just done, done a loop around. This is a, a lodge here on the right. This is our warden's house on the left. Um, and the gate, the main entrance to the Saudi uh, Sands, or at least the northern Saudi Sands, is just ahead of us here. So quite a lot of infrastructure, but the animals of this area have become accustomed to people to a degree, to a large degree, and don't mind slinking around, especially after dark, in and around these inhabited areas, as they don't mind moving in and around the lodge areas that are kind of on the center parts of the reserve. I'm actually told Brent had to peek over the fence that we've just been driving along once because there was monkeys alarm calling and he saw a leopard in the guy's garden. Now, I'm guessing we may find some more tracks coming past here after that leopard may have finished taking a drink down at the water where it went to. First inspection. Maybe I've missed them, and what I'll do is I just want to go across to where Aubrey did find some tracks. 
and some of the gate guards on our right. Avshin, Nimjani. We're born in Ingwe. Konkonzo Maningi. La. La. Kenzila. So, the gate guards have no idea that there was a leopard lurking around here last night. They probably would have been fast asleep, as we all were. Um, but I was hoping that they may have had some useful information. They often do have great feedback for us regarding animals that may have moved past this area. tracks on the right and oh yeah, there we go nice and crystal clear tracks heading up in that direction you can see the toes in front again so this leopard was lurking around this area and it's quite interesting let me walk you along its path along here and then possibly scent marks up on this bush. Yes, it's scent marks over here. And I've got some more tracks coming down over here. stuck. confirm that she has in fact moved off and now I'll get a hold of the guides from Sibambili whose property she's headed on to and let them know that they've at least got some tracks to follow up on good it's warming up quite considerably interesting this leopard's been moving in and around this whole area last night. Possibly not Karula, possibly Shadow, possibly that other young female, Shiluva. Well, for those of you who joined in a few days ago, um, I was abused for my running style by both Kirsty and I can't remember who it was. One of the viewers said I ran like a girl, but now Kirsty just very kindly gave me an 8 out of 10 for that little jog that I've just done, so I'm getting there. Thank you, Kirsty. All right, and I got a 10 out of 10 for scent marking, so at least I know when in doubt, rather scent mark than attempt to jog. <laughs> Morning guys, the Mafazi Ingwe has crossed into Subambili about 20 meters north of the Vuatilla signboards on Triple M. Copy that. Good luck. Okay, now they keep lurking in this kind of northwestern section of the property there's a chance that this leopard could come back onto Juma and that's what we're going to hope for and if not her we'll bump into something else no doubt It 
It's an absolutely wonderful morning. Kathy in Florida, hello. And you'd like to know any updates on Quatile, a female leopard. And I don't know for certain, but there are rumors that she has three cubs, Kathy. She is not a leopard that we see very often, though. and the only times that I've actually seen her is when she's been mating, as far as I can remember. And she's moved out of her usual territory towards Juma in search of males. And she's mated with two different males. And the first time I saw her, she was mating with Mvula. When Mvula got booted by Tingana, and the next time we saw her, she was actually mating with Tingana. So, uh, not too sure though on her status of her and her cubs because we don't see her too much naturally. I don't have the most concern for her and her whereabouts. And now that she has cubs, I find it highly unlikely that we're going to see her for the foreseeable future. Again, she's only out of her territory onto other female leopards' territories, Karula's territory, Shadow's territory, in the hope that she can mate, and so not only just mate, but also try and establish relationships with as many males as possible. Female leopards are incredibly clever and will mate with multiple males, knowing that if they all think that they are the father to her most current cubs, none of them are going to try and kill those cubs because leopards, as well as lions, and a lot of different predators will kill cubs that were not fathered by themselves. And that ensures that only the strongest genes make it through. It's one of Mother Nature's very useful techniques to, like I said, make sure the strongest, most prominent genes are the ones that make it through. In Wisconsin, you've noticed that these tracks look very small. And you'd like to know how big they are. You're right, they are very small tracks. And they are probably only about that size, about five to six centimeters in diameter. Um, and that's because they are female leopard tracks and female leopards are small and have small feet. These aren't actually incredibly small. You get some female leopards with tiny feet and others with slightly large ones. And that goes for body size as well. No different to humans. All the animals come out here in different shapes and sizes. It's just not easy for us as humans to be able to distinguish and notice these size differences, or at least not to the untrained eye. is where these leopard tracks came from. This is the area that I first saw them in, just a little bit behind us, and it's quite useful just to know which pathways animals have taken, even if you can't follow, further follow their trail, it can be very useful to know which paths they've used, and therefore when you track them again, in a similar area, you've got a possible idea as to where they've moved. So I spotted the tracks a bit late, so I've got them again here now, walking down the right-hand side of this road. I'm not going to show you every track because it can be quite time-consuming, but I just want to work out where it came from, because that may also not just help us for next time, but it may also help us work out leopard it was. Tracks are still on the road here. Sure. I saw them very late, but in my defense, it was dark when we were driving around earlier on. Last tracks I had came from the left-hand side of the road. Who could this be? Could this be? The Queen Karula, the same leopard we had yesterday morning, could, could well be. 
and the territory is fluctuating greatly. So, always useful just to make sure. Okay, well, we're going to send you across to Francis, find you guys a little arachnid. So, I just suddenly saw this little sort of dot on our dashboard, and it is a tiny, tiny little jumping spider. I'm just going to wait for him to turn around, and then I'm going to put my finger in there for, for scale. He might jump. So, that's how small he is. Isn't that incredible? Tiny, tiny little guy. Making webs all over the vehicle and there's leaps and bounds across. I don't know if you don't need to move forward a little bit of squirrel sunning himself. But I mean look at that. Gone. Tiny little thing. And there is a squirrel. Here he is. Catching the morning rays. The Kathy Hughes from sunny Florida is wondering do we have tarantula spiders? Oh, there's a starling as well. A Birchall's starling. Um, Kathy, we don't. Uh, the closest thing we've got to a tarantula is called a, a baboon spider. They look very similar, but they're not tarantulas. Off disappears the starling. And we can, oh, the squirrel's moving on the other side of the tree. Now, this is the big dead leadwood tree, and we're on Leadwood Road, and that's where it gets its name from. So, leadwoods are uh, because of Because of how dense their wood is, they can actually stay standing for up to over 100 years once they're dead. And not so much here, but in places like Botswana. It gives you a very good idea of seriously wet cycles and whatnot. So when you've got those floodplains, you quite often have really beautiful leadwood forests on the edge. And uh, all of a sudden, you have sort of a whole forest of dead leadwoods. So you can sort of tell when the last really wet cycle was, depending on the dead leadwoods. Is that Scotty's just calling me? Go ahead. No, I think these are tracks from dark shadows. Brown ivory on the part of the place. That's where we're going to be there. We're going to be there. We're going to be Copy, thanks. Good luck. There we go. Unfortunately, those tracks Buddy was following seem to have crossed uh, out. He's just updating me and uh, probably shadow just from the movement of those tracks. So, and also, he's just going to double check our northern boundary to see if Karula the Queen has decided to return to grace us with her presence. So, Karula's last successful litter of cubs uh, was two males, Konuma and Quarantine, and sometimes they come back onto Juma in this area. So, Eric in Virginia Beach has asked me to tell you a story about the most leopards I've ever seen in one spot. Uh, and the seven leopards, can you believe it? A proper leap of leopards. Very unusual circumstance. Um, it was on the Sand River, probably about seven or eight kilometers to the south of where we are now. Uh, there was a beautiful big male leopard who was what, probably my, one of my favorite leopards of all time by the name of the Campan male. And he used to hold territory on Londolozi uh, around the Sand River. And uh, there was 
an unusual thing that the fact that there were there were five female leopards who were in estrus all at about the same time. So they were literally all trying to mate with them at the same time and all sort of growling, snarling, hissing. Uh, and one young male who had followed his mom um, and now really didn't want to be there and he was sort of sitting in a tree going, oh, what am I doing? Um, but that was an incredible sighting. And definitely the most leopards I've seen in a single sighting. And the most leopards I've seen in a sight, single sighting here is three or four. I can't remember. I, had, I think it was four. But we could barely see the fourth. Uh, we had Karula, Konyuma, Vula, uh, and Quarantine all in one sighting. And that was actually on the road we were driving on earlier. But every now and then, you do get a, a leap of leopards, but generally we do find them uh, by themselves. So I promised to tell you a story about alarm calls, baboons, and lions. So there's a fantastic Botswana guide I worked with in northern Botswana by the name of Steve Kalkala. And, uh, and we were watching a pride of lions move through the tree islands of the Okavango Delta. And they happened to catch a troop, big troop of baboons, about 110, 120 strong, um, out in the open between. Uh, there was a big termite mound that had sort of one big uh, African ebony on it and two small fever berries. Uh, and that was the only cover there. And then the rest, the next set of trees and the tree island, there's lots of cover was probably 200 meters away. And the lions caught them on the open and charged at them. The majority of the troop managed to get to the edge of the tree island, like up, up. but eight individuals uh, only managed to get to this very small sort of secluded spot in the middle of the open area. And uh, Steve telling the story is possibly one of the funniest things you'll ever see in your life. So he says the baboons were shouting. So the ones that were stuck in this tree, uh, we're getting advice from all the ones that had made it to the safer area. And the one baboon would shout, Lion! And the other one would go, Wah! It's there! Lion! And all shouting, shouting, shouting. And then <coughs> one would say, Jump! The other one said, No, don't jump! Lion! Jump! Don't jump! And it went on and on and on and on. Till eventually, uh, one of the sort of, no, let me explain, so in the big, in the big ebony, there were six uh, sort of females, sub-adult baboons, and in this very small bush, probably no taller than this one coming up here, this one here, so very much jumping height for a lioness, uh, there were two males. So eventually one of the females in the big ebony was listening to the incorrect advice of being shouted from the sideline, Jump! And so she jumped. Literally, as she hit the ground, the lions were on it. And in that little bush that was that, just that high, there were two big, big male baboons. And as soon as that, that first baboon got grabbed, one of the big male baboons said, Stop it! Stop it! Started shouting and drew attention to himself. And so the lioness ran up and literally hooked him out of the tree. Dom, down. End of line, uh, end of baboon. And over the course of the next hour, the five remaining baboons in the big tree all leapt and were killed by the lions. And obviously, lots of shouting, Lions, stop it! Jump! Don't jump! And the one single big male baboon who was left in that tiny little tree, after the one got hooked out of the tree next to him, he literally just did this. And just probably have an accident. He just went like this, almost grabbed the branches around him, and he just went, and he closed his eyes, and he sat there for a good, I think an hour probably after the lions had left. That was an absolutely fantastic um, sighting. tracks on Leadwood. Leadwood's often a really good road to check. Um, 
seems leopards like that young quarantine male like to sneak in here. Wow. So this morning seems to be hotting up. Scotty is on fire. So let's go see what he's found. Wow, everyone, we owe Ted a very big thank you. Um, you'll see why right now. Look what he's found us. Oh yes, it's a leopard. And I'm 99% certain it's Karuna returning home to Juma after a little vacation to the north of us. And the reason I'm convinced it's her is because the leopard we were tracking earlier, as I told Brent over the radio, we assumed to be shadow, just judging by the movements of her tracks. And that was the benefits of actually backtracking, because when I realized it was shadow, then I thought it would be worthwhile coming here. And how lucky do you get? Not much luckier than this, I don't think. How awesome. Seb's just said calmly, leopard. I said, sorry, what? He said, no, the leopard's just there. <laughs> awesome. So we tracked one leopard and then found another without tracking it, thanks to tracking the other one that we didn't find. How bizarre. Now it is fairly thick in here. Oh, she's had a meal, it looks like. Nothing too big, but her belly is certainly larger than it was yesterday morning when we last saw her. So she's had a successful 24 hours and managed to feed on something. Who knows what? Maybe it was something small that she caught and consumed the whole animal. Or maybe it was something large that was stolen from her. Hard to say but at least she's full-bellied and in our sights. Absolutely beautiful. I love watching them move through thick bush like this. And Oh, she's just caught a baby diker. She's just caught a diker. Can you believe it? Let's hurry on in there. Hold on, hold on, everyone. Shame. The baby diker, it's still alive. And she's just busy suffocating it. It won't take too long, but it does depend. So if any of you are sensitive, you may want to return in a few minutes because this little diker is going to struggle. 